You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. It's one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcasts this week. These are one of my favorite interviews to do. I love that vet rehabbers get to share with us their wins and their losses. And although it's not great that they made the mistakes, they share with us and we get to learn from them. So when we find ourselves in that same position, we have hindsight, which we would never have had before. So you guys get to fast track your success by not repeating the same mistakes that they've made. So this week, I speak to Sean Johnson from Happy Feet Animal Physiotherapy in South Africa. She shares with us how her practice has grown from mainly word of mouth and vet referrals. She strategically set herself up in an area where there was a need for vet rehab and how this has really worked to her advantage. She discusses how she had worked with a business mentor and then started to question what she was actually wanting from her practice. Now, sometimes we think we should be on this journey of growth from mobile practice to brick and mortar to opening up multi branches and hiring more therapists. This works for some, but not for all of us. So before you go down that road, it's always good to decide for yourself what you actually want. So for some vet rehabbers, the mobile model works perfectly and they continue to practice this way for most of their career. Now, if you have not already, please come and join the largest vet rehab community on Facebook. We have four groups, small animal vet rehabbers, hydro vet rehabbers, equine vet rehabbers, and the business vet rehabbers. This is where the vet rehabbers hang out online. They share knowledge, tips, and advice, and it's a great supportive community, and we'd love to have you online there with us. This week, we add yet another webinar recording to our library of now 78 hours of hydro therapy-specific learning. So this webinar is specifically for our Hydro platform. It's lectured by Ariel Pachette Markley. And one of the things we know about Ariel that it's going to be very thorough. She is lecturing on what's new in hydrotherapy research. Ariel is one of our research boffins in the vet rehab community. She even has her own library of over 2,000 vet rehab research articles. So without further ado, over to Sean. Hey, Sean, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. So I think this is the second time you've been on the podcast. The first time you were chatting about your your master's, quite a while ago, wasn't it? I think it was in the beginning of when you started doing your podcast. So you've done quite a few in between. So today we're doing one of the Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcasts. And these are one of my favorite podcasts to do. So the first question I always ask is, how did you get into the field of vet rehab? Uh, Once upon a time, I was determined that I was going to be a vet. So I actually started off my academic career at University of Pretoria, trying to get into UNOS to put it. And it was one of these instances where it just wasn't meant to be for me. And I felt like the door kept slamming in my face as much as I wanted to work with animals. It was something that I just felt like eventually I had to give up on my dream of being a vet. But as soon as I, I think that it was a bit of divine intervention where I mentioned to my mother who lives in the UK that if it's not going to happen for me, then I would like to become a vet and physiotherapist. And she found a course for me that I could do my master's degree in the UK where I could become a veterinary physiotherapist. And it was amazing. As soon as I kind of started going on a different path, as soon as I applied for my master's degree, I made it in first round. And then I went and studied in the UK and became a veterinary physiotherapist, which was probably one of the best things that ever happened. Awesome. So how long was that master's degree? So I lived in the UK for three years where I did two years of distance learning and practical lectures. So I ended up doing those two years in the UK. In the UK, you can actually finish with that qualification, which gives you a postgraduate diploma. Um, And you can just practice with that. But then if you do a thesis, then you get the full master's degree. So I wanted to complete the full degree. So then I came back to South Africa and I did two years of doing a thesis. So all in all, it took me four years, but I did two years in the UK and I did two years in South Africa. Awesome. So fast track to today. How do things look for Sean? Everything is absolutely incredible. I feel so blessed to be working in this profession. I've been running my business for eight years now, and it's amazing to see the success that I've been able to very organically build up for myself. I feel like it's one of these things that if you're kind of working on the right path and you're kind of moving in the direction that I feel is a soul journey, it's amazing how things just kind of flow your way. So 
I've built up an incredible mobile practice for myself. I've got a very nice flow of clients. I feel like I've got a lot of people that they just kind of find their way into my life. And it's amazing how my profession brings such incredible people, such incredible animals and such incredible stories into my space. So I'm very blessed to do what I'm doing every day. So are you only doing mobile at the moment? I'm only doing mobile. I have started to try and just transition a little bit to doing a little bit of work at my house. So if I've got some people that um, call me for the first time, I do try and ask them if they can come to me, then it really helps me. And that's purely based on a time kind of factor. Because when you do when you're a mobile practitioner, you lose quite a lot of your time and your day by driving around. So then you're quite limited in the amount of clients that you're able to see. So I'm trying to transition those who can come to me to come to my house, just in the sense that on those days, and I try and do it on Wednesdays and Thursdays, then I can maybe see an extra client on that day. So it suddenly gives me that extra hour or two in my week that I can fit in another time. Yeah. And what kind of space have you got at home? I actually just pop a blanket down and I sit on the grass with my clients. I've got a beautiful garden space that I've set up for myself. And because I don't necessarily need a lot of equipment, because I'm working as a mobile practitioner, I've always got a use to just having what I what I need with me. And one of my biggest tools that I use is my hands. So I kind of don't tend to go into doing things like hydrotherapy because I'm not used to doing it. It's not really my field of expertise. So I've always said, as long as I've got myself in the consult, that's all I really need. So I just sit on the grass and then I treat the dogs as I would in the home environment. And then I just treat them like that, which my clients seem to be very happy with what they get out of the treatment. And how many days a week are you practicing? So I treat Monday to Friday. I've made a rule for myself not to work on weekends. There was a point where I, in the beginning of my practice where I was working on weekends. Um, and I just felt like I, I kept getting way too close to burning out. And I think it's one of these things like, you know, you, you want to give so much and you want to kind of like look after everyone. But I've had a few uh, close calls to burnout where I've learned to just take a little bit of time for myself. So that's why I don't work weekends at all. Um, and then I work Monday to Friday. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to do. I was exactly the same. I also said yeah. no weekends. So it's, it's a bit was... of a slippery slope because before you know it, you're working almost seven days a week because people yeah. will always want more from you. So I think sometimes you've also just got to say no. And also you can even say I'll work half day on Saturday and then it, you know, you leave there two, then you leave there yeah. three, then you leave there yeah, four. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, chatting about the burnout, I think that a lot of us can resonate with that because it's something that a lot of us suffer from and we've got to catch ourselves really when that happens. So for you, what were the signs? Like when did you realize, oh, I'm not good? What was it about how you felt or what you did that actually made you think, whoa, I got to catch myself here? I, th I think the, the specific incidents that happened for me where it was a bit of a wake-up call of just pretending to be okay, but, you know, underneath the surface, not really feeling so lacquer, is in the eight years of my business, I've always had a very good reputation of having um, great relationships with the dogs that I work with. And I've never in my eight years of my business actually been bitten by a client's dog. And I had a, a week where I was really not feeling okay. I think I was just pushing myself too hard, but I was going to work and I was just trying to be fine. And then I had a week where I had three dogs try and bite me, one of which was very, very close. And, you know, I had this German shepherd launch itself onto me. Thank goodness it didn't end up getting me. But I think it was a bit of a wake up call in the fact that you can maybe pretend to people that you're okay, but it's amazing how dogs can pick up on the fact that you are actually in quite a weak space. So, you know, I kind of realized I can't fake it with dogs. Like yeah. if I'm not feeling okay, they're going to pick up on that and I'm going to get hurt. And I think the fact that I had three dogs try and go for me in the space of about five days, I kind of sat back by the time it happened the third time. And I was like, whoa, what's going on here? 
I'm not feeling okay and I need to change something to make sure that I'm just looking after myself a little bit. So that was the, it was a very specific incident that happened where I realized you can't fake it with animals. Well no. done for realizing that that's not the norm because what yeah. you c- could have happened is you could have just uh, you know got a bit of a fright and then became yeah. more nervous and then the more nervous yeah. you are the dogs then pick up on that and then they yeah. tend but to it, as soon up. as I stopped working on weekends I've never ever had that happen again so it was quite a quite a stark difference in the fact that I put a little bit of time for myself I allowed myself to switch off and rest and from that I've never ever had that happen again so it just shows you the fact that you know the dogs in a sense were just trying to tell me look after yourself yeah and we need to be in a good space to be able to treat effectively yeah if we're like and especially like i always find like if your mind is running all over the place when you're treating and you're then you're not 100 percent in it you know like energy wise and everything i always feel like i need to be like 100 percent there with that patient and thinking about healing and thinking about what i'm doing but if your mind is elsewhere and usually when, you know, we're stressed, that's what happens. Our minds are racing everywhere. So, yeah. yeah. So, Sean, how many cases do, well, on average would you see a day now? So at the moment, I'm kind of seeing about six to seven cases a day. As I say, if I have some clients that come through to my house and then I've got a little bit of extra time, I can maybe push it to about eight. But um, I try not to pull my day up too much because because again, it's one of these things that if I see eight cases a day every day, I'm going to end up being pooped by the end of the week. So I've got to try and just make sure that I balance it out for myself and make sure that I'm not pushing myself too hard that um, by the end of the week, then I don't have anything left to give. So I think there's always a bit of a balancing act in just making sure that I'm looking after myself as well as making sure that I'm looking after my clients. And then what I've recently done is if I feel like I've got a bit of an overflow of clients and they're not directly coming from one of my veterinary practices I work with, I do give them the option of going to another practice, which maybe has a few more people in it, and then they can have the option of going somewhere else. If there's a reason why they specifically want me, well, then I'll make sure that I make some time for them. But I think it's also kind of learning not to be superwoman and the fact that I'm only one person I'm the only person in my business so there does come a point where I've got to kind of say I don't have enough time to look after all of you and would you like to go to another practice I love that Sean because that's like you know vet rehabbers are working together right because it's yeah. it's it's for the animals right so sometimes you know I think um, some people might be wanting to keep everything for themselves so I love the fact that you you know you'll refer out if you if you're overwhelmed and you've got yes. so much yes yes and just having those relationships and those connections with other practitioners that it just says hey can you maybe help me out with this case? Because it also works vice versa, where maybe sometimes they need a bit of help from my side and then, you know, we've got each other. Yeah, so I mean, I can see really how you can have, you could have quite a lot of synergy with a brick and mortar vet rehab practice because for them, they might need somebody who's mobile. So let's say there's a, a client who can't bring a dog. So if you're working together with them, when they have those cases, they'll refer to you. And when you've got too many, you refer back to them. Yes, definitely. And I think also having those hydrotherapy practices that I'm linked up to, I mean, there is definitely a need sometimes where they say, I need what you can give. So I'm going to send this case through to you. And it's something where, you know, there's benefit to the different ways of doing things. Because sometimes the hydroth, I always say, if you can do the two together, that's that's the, the gold standard. But, you know, sometimes people need hydro. Sometimes people need at home mobile physical therapy so you know it's just kind of they, they complement each other and sometimes one thing is right for one case and one thing is right for another and technically you, the combination is what is what is ideal yeah I mean definitely working yeah. together with a hydrotherapist I mean I think yeah. that's also one of the reasons that people you know when you're mobile you actually expand into creating a practice because you think I should be offering a hydrotherapy mm. have you yeah. ever had those thoughts I have had those thoughts and I have, you know, I I think within the area that I'm in, so if I can just give a bit of background in terms of of where I've based my practice and where I've actually set my practice up. So 
when I did my master's thesis, um, it was quite a cool exercise to be able to go around to the vets in my area and give them questionnaires and ask them about what do they think of physio, are they interested in working with physios, and because I did that within my immediate area, I was able to get a gap where I was like, oh my gosh, there's nobody working here, like this area needs a physiotherapist. So that was where I started to build my business because I realized there was that gap. So I'm still in that area. I'm still the only person in the area. And I think that there would be benefit of building a hydrotherapy practice in the area in the future. But I think I have also realized sometimes that there's benefit in doing things in a different way to how other people do it. And, you know, I mustn't always try and be like other people because sometimes what I'm doing is of benefit as well. I think in the future, if I could get more staff and get more help and have some extra hands on board, then it would be good to be able to kind of branch into that. But I think as long as I'm on my own, I think that what I'm doing is of benefit to my clients. It's quite different to what other people do. And I think that it's something which I must also embrace my my differences in the industry. Yeah, I mean, one of these things sort of trying to think about where you're going and whether you should open up a, a practice or you shouldn't, it's one of those tricky transitions from mobile to practice. Yeah. And I know because you and I have done a few strategy calls before, I know that you were thinking about it and you actually enlisted in a business coach. Yeah. Um, how did that go? So I worked with a business coach about two years ago, and I think it was a really great exercise in just pushing me to look at where I'm going, what is the direction that I'm moving into. I did find I struggled with the concept of that specific business coach in the sense that they were quite focused on building the practice, building the team of people, and they kind of had a bit of a box that they would kind of put my practice into. And I think that it actually ended up causing me a huge amount of anxiety because I got to a point where I was like, this doesn't feel right to me. This doesn't feel like it's me. I'm not someone who wants to take on a huge amount of debt. I'm not someone that wants a huge amount of overheads. I'm quite a quite a simple person and I, and I like that. And I felt like they were kind of trying to make me into someone that has this big practice and has all the staff and it actually almost made me have a complete anxiety attack because I just didn't feel like I was being true to myself. So I took a step back and I was like, what am I aiming for here and what is it that I would like to create for myself? And I would like to build a practice at some point and have a couple of staff members, but I'm not someone that wants the complication of having a huge practice and lots of people to manage. I'm unfortunately a bit of a conflict avoider. So I find dealing with people and dealing with staff and conflicts and stuff like that, it's something that is actually very difficult for someone like me. So I ended up kind of stepping back and getting, I actually ended up sending a questionnaire to my clients. And I kind of asked my clients, what is it that you guys like? What is it that you would like me to change about my practice? And pretty much the overwhelming feedback was, we love you. You're amazing. Don't change anything. Just be who you are. And I think that was really nice to hear from my clients that they were happy with what I was doing already. And they don't need me to have the big hydrotherapy practice, that they could see the results with me just sitting on the floor, treating their dogs, and the fact that they saw that was of value. So, you know, I think it was a bit of a wake up call to just being true to myself. Yeah, it's awesome that you did that because you got such clarity from it. And often yeah. I think we we think we know what people want or yeah. need. And then when you ask them, it's very different, right? Yeah. So, yeah, that was a, a great move. And, and I'm glad think, that... I think if yeah. I can just add something in there quickly. So I work with a hydrotherapist with my own animals. And, you know, it's interesting listening to her speak sometimes in the sense that, you know, sometimes she says, I just want to sit and treat the animals. That's all I want to do. Like, you know, you get all this business stuff and then it's all about treat, uh, running the business. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that now you're kind of treating the animals, but you're also, you're also running the business. And the thing is, I honestly get to spend my day treating the animals and I get to do what I love so you know I think that's such a key thing to remember is that that that's what we want to do and by keeping my business simple I'm able to really focus on the aspects of my business that I love yeah and I think that that's the thing is sometimes we we think 
that the path is mobile practice, brick and mortar, then add another therapist, then add a whole lot more therapists. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be like, like, like that's one way, one journey yeah. you could go on. And, you know, I, I hear a lot of people also that open practices and then eventually sell them uh, and actually go to be employed because they actually realize I don't like all that management side of things. And, and it, the reality of it is that if it is your practice, the more staff you get, the less you consult, the more you mm. manage, the more you spend time doing financials and all those kind of things, unless you've got a brilliant practice manager. Yeah. But even then you've got to meet with the practice manager and then there's issues with the staff and this and that. So you, you as the owner, you take that on. So you've got to realize what is it exactly that I want to do. And I think that a lot of us just want to treat the animals. Yeah. So I, I think the mobile practice suits a lot of us, but saying that you still have a lot of responsibilities when you own a mobile practice. I mean, yeah. how do you fit in all the admin, especially, you know, I, I remember driving, it's such wasted time because you, you can't do things, you know? Yeah. So how do you fit in all the administration and do you have a PA or do you have an assistant or is it literally just you running the practice? Cause it's not just the consulting. These are a whole yeah, lot yeah, of yeah. things. Yeah. So up until about a year ago, it was pretty much just me doing everything. And I think that I was just getting to a point that every year my business seems to get a little bit busier. So then suddenly that hour or two that I maybe had to do the admin, is now precious time that I can actually go and see clients. So a year ago, I did take on a PA. It was quite a big step for me because as I say, I'm a little bit, I've, I've, in my entire life, I've never ever worked with anyone. I've, I've only ever done what I've done and I've only ever been responsible for doing everything myself. So it was a bit of a learning curve taking on a staff member as much as it's just a PA, but it's still someone you have to manage, someone you have to delegate to, someone you have to have conflict resolution skills. So it was a little bit of a learning curve, but it's made such a huge difference in just handing certain tasks over to someone else that I don't have to do. So I think that was a big learning curve is there's some things that other people can do for me. And then I can then again, focus on practicing. I think I'm very, very blessed as well that my boyfriend is hugely passionate about helping me with my career. So he also helps me with a lot of my bookkeeping and, and um, accounting kind of stuff. So I'm very lucky that I've got people behind me that are wanting me to do well and wanting me to just focus on my career. So I think it's something which is, is a recent change in my business taking on the PA, but it is something which I think has been a bit of a game changer for me in, in focusing on the things that I want to focus on and allowing someone else to really sit and do the admin stuff properly and put the time and effort into it. I still think there's times where you have to sit and do admin, but I think the admin that I'm doing now is more the stuff that is important to me. So rather than sitting and setting my diary up all the time and sending invoices out and stuff like that, I'm much more focused on writing notes. I'm much better at emailing all my vets. So it's just been able to allow me to shift the focus in this is what I need to do. And this is stuff that other people can do. Yeah. And those yeah. things are the important things to grow your yes. practice, you know, the emailing yes. and the networking and communicating. Yeah. And yeah. if you, yeah, I think that a lot of us are very scared to make that jump because it's another person's salary that you have to pay. Yeah. Um, and sometimes even if they're part-time, it's still a commitment, right? Yeah. And I think, oh, what happens if I don't have enough money? What happens if I have a really quiet month? But in, in my experience, it never works that way. Like you no. sort of like, you say to the universe, like, you know, getting some help and it opens up time. And then what just happens is you just get more consults and you just get busier by opening up that time. For me, that's always happened. I, th I think that's happened, but what I think what was interesting, I think you guys put a, a post up the other day on your Facebook page about increasing your prices and not getting trapped in the cycle of just filling your time more, but actually everything has gone up and up and up. And that is something that was also a bit of a, a lesson to me at the end of last year is, you know, I worked harder than I ever worked at the end of last year, but I think what I was doing was I was just trying to keep up with the fact that everything has gotten really expensive. So, you know, I don't have a huge amount of overheads, but because I'm driving around a lot, I mean, these increases in the petrol price are huge for me because I drive around all day. So 
you know, I think it's also being careful of getting trapped in this cycle of, of just working harder just to be able to keep up with the increasing, uh, increases in costs. Uh, but it is something in terms of taking on that staff member is it really, really has helped my business. So it is a necessary sacrifice for me. And it's something which I feel like my business is better off for. So it's one of those things that I'm glad that I took on and that I took that leap. Yeah, that post was actually, I saw an Instagram post and somebody had said, it's been eight years. This is the first price increase I've had in eight years. And I thought, oh my gosh, this person hasn't increased their prices in eight years. And yeah. sometimes that's what happens. So you, yeah, before you realize it, and probably that person was just consulting three more consults a day and still earning the same amount of money. So yeah, you do every year, you need to have like a little reminder, say, but a checkout. And, and you know, for you, even that assistant is extra yeah. expenses, right? So in order for you to be able to cover those extra expenses, a little price increases is needed. But also value yourself, because I know that you preach about this a lot in the sense of, you know, what is your number? What is it that yeah. you're doing? Because I think that we quite naturally as professionals want to put everyone else first and I'm completely guilty of that particularly in COVID because I was trying to be quite considerate to people in the sense that people may have been struggling a little bit but you know I kind of realized at the end of last year I was like I need to put myself in the equation here as well so I think just making sure that we don't forget about ourselves definitely and don't undersell yourself yeah so yeah. you know doctors and specialists you're a specialist they don't say oh sure, I'll give you like a 50% discount or 30% discount, you know? And I think it's just the type of people that we are. We're very kind hearted and we care about the animals and like, we just want to help. Um, but in the end, you know, you do need to make a living. And that's yeah. the thing is that, you know, and I often say to vet rehab is like, if you're not making profit in your, in your business, then you might as well just be employed. So then just yeah. go and get a job, you know, because then you earn a salary. So you need to be making profit. So, because it's risk, it's a risk having your own business. And so there needs to be a reward for that risk that you put yourself in. Definitely. Yeah. So if you look back, what are the biggest struggles that you've had about working by yourself and mobile? I think one of the big things is you're quite isolated. Um, I, I'm definitely on my own most of the time. So sometimes it hasn't always been that easy Say if you're struggling with a case or if you're just having a bit of a bad day, you know, you on your own, you don't really have people around you. So I think sometimes that it has gotten quite lonely on, on my own. So I think that that's probably one of the big things, which is, is just... I, I'm someone that I kind of need someone to just give me a bit of a push sometimes. And, you know, I don't really have anyone behind me to kind of push me and just tell me, hey, you could do this better and, hey, make time for this. So that all ends up being put on yourself to be that person. So we have the Small Animal Vet Rehabbers Facebook group. So please, I never want you to feel alone. So if you've ever got cases and you need some advice, just post them in there, take a picture and post in the group and um, yeah there's an awesome awesome community i think in this one well, i think we've got three and a half thousand vet rehabbers from all over the world so are you on that group yes i am on that. you are okay yes. awesome so one of the things that mobile practitioners and especially people that are on their own and i think one of the problems is is that often you qualify and then your first move is to go mobile because it's something, you know, the barrier to entry into mobile is a whole lot less than getting a brick and mortar practice. And you, like you say, you just need your hands really, and you can buy yeah. some equipment, but, and so most of the people are newly qualified and then they come into having a mobile practice. And, you know, what I've found interviewing vet rehabbers from all over the world is that self-doubt creeps in and confidence is an issue. Is that something you experienced? And if it was, how did you overcome it? You know, I definitely struggle with it in certain regards where, you know, I think there's lots of different avenues in the sense of how people come into the industry. And, you know, I think certain avenues have some strengths and other people have other strengths. And I think for myself, it's, it's things like advancing my clinical skills and just kind of thinking a little bit more about why I'm doing things and what effect it's having. So I think that for me, it's just believing in what I'm doing on a clinical basis, but also if I'm struggling with something to be able to go and actually learn more about it and to be able to advance those aspects that I feel like I'm weak in. 
but I must say that I get a lot of confidence and affirmation from my clients because of the technique that I use and because of the way that I work. I, I must say, like, my clients really turn around to me the day after I've treated their dog. And they just like, Sean, the dog was like a different dog the next day. So I get a lot of confidence from my clients. But, you know, I think sometimes I have to just remind myself that I'm doing a good job because I think we always seem to be our own worst critics. Yeah. And I think that it's something where, you know, you've got to really believe in what you're doing and the, the service that you're offering to people and the difference that you're making in people's lives. If I feel like there's things I'm struggling with, that those are, are, are things that I'm bringing awareness to and I'm making an effort to make sure I improve on these things, which is where I really appreciate platforms such as your platform, because there's so many different webinars and things that I can go and, and watch where it's quite nice sometimes that I actually do know the stuff. And it's just about reminding myself because, you know, because I've been out of university now for eight years, you know, it kind of gets put into the back of your mind and you don't always remember it offhand, but you actually do know a lot more than you think you know. Yeah. And sometimes you just need to remind yourself. So um, I think for myself, it's just also recognizing those areas of weakness and saying, you know, that's not such a bad thing. We're able to, to improve on those things. And I think it's always important just to work on areas of weakness and don't beat up on yourself because I think we beat up on ourselves and then we don't really end up actually helping out. Yeah, I mean, we, we did a Facebook Live a few weeks ago on mindset. I don't know if you, if you watched that. I did, I did watch um, that one. And yeah, we actually, it's going to be one of the podcasts too. And yeah, I mean, I think that we sometimes can self-sabotage ourselves by what's in, in our head and what our sub subconscious is telling us. So yeah, it's important to recognize that. And yeah, I mean, I love the fact that you've got that never stop learning attitude. So there are a lot of, professionals I think that study and then think that that's it now I, I have the qualification I don't need yeah. to carry on learning but we're in a medical field and I think that with what our field is things that are changing so much so we, we need to keep up to date with all the changes that are happening so yeah well done for, for doing you. that thank you and thank you for always also just giving us that community of the fact that sometimes you do think that you're on your own but it's something where it's you know, we're all in this together. And some of the things that I struggle with, there's a lot of other people that also struggle with it. So, you know, we can really support each other. And, and it's just, yeah, it's, it's not just me. It's, yeah. it's a thing that actually a lot of people struggle with, and we can, we can really help. Each other. What I find so amazing is that, you know, Online Pets are started in, in Cape Town or in South Africa. And we've got nine people from 96 different countries now. So there's a vet we have is really from all over the world. So it is a, it is a great community. Yeah. Sean, before we end, I'd love to hear what you think is unique about your practice and, and, and how you treat animals. So I think for myself, being a mobile at home physiotherapist, you know, you don't really have all the equipment. I mean, I've got equipment, I've got my ultrasound machine, I've got my laser, but I was always taught when I was at university that you should have yourself first and then everything else is a bonus. So I find that I am a master at manual therapy. Um, I've always been very hands-on as a therapist. It's always been something that for me is my hands are my ultimate tool. And because I, I have focused on that, I think I've really been able to develop the skill. And I recently did a course called the Masterson Method, which I am now a certified practitioner in. And it's very much, it's, it's what we define as a touch therapy technique. And it's something which is based on communication and listening to the subtle communication skills of the animal. And through that, you are actually giving a myofascial release in the tissue. So it's quite big about opening the body up. I'm very big about bringing balance into the body. So then once the body's in balance and once the body is moving correctly, then it's a really good time to bring in strengthening. And I think what's made my, made my practice quite unique is it's a technique that I've learned in horses that I've transferred the skills into my work with dogs and cats, which I think as far as I understand within the Masters and Method community, I'm probably one of two people in the whole world that really practices and is focused on, on dogs and cats with huge success. It's really made my practice what it is. And I love the fact that the client will phone me the day after and they will say, wow, 
what a difference this dog was like a completely different dog the next day particularly when you're working on things like older animals where it's like they all scratched up and they can't move and they're so stiff and then you suddenly start opening that body up and allowing them to move correctly of course then bringing in the strength aspect after that but it's something which has completely changed the way that I work and I'm very thankful that I was able to learn that skill and to be able to offer that to the world of dogs and cats because it's something that's made me quite a unique practitioner and something that I think makes me a, a great asset to other practitioners where maybe they need someone to focus a bit more on the manual therapy and then they can focus more on the hydrotherapy and the strength thing so I think that it's made me quite unique as a practitioner in the sense that my hands are my greatest tool I think the clients absolutely love the fact that in a sense, because I'm reading the animal's body language, like I almost, I always say to them, I feel like I'm having a conversation with the dog. And it's quite a, a visual thing where you can actually see how the animal is reacting when you're on an area of pain and how they kind of don't want you to be there because they're saying it's sore, but because you're just touching them and in a sense, you're only making them think about it. It's something where if you just sit and listen to them, they've got a lot to say in terms of where they're feeling for. And it's, it's quite cool because there is an element of communication in it, which it helps the owners to better understand that, hey, if I touch my dog over its hips and it suddenly gets up and wants to move away from me, maybe my dog is actually talking to me. And it just helps those owners to be able to better understand the animals, which um, I think has been a huge defining point of my of my business so you're a little bit like an animal whisperer I've, I've got a bit of a reputation as an animal <laughs> yeah. whisperer so but I think it's really important to make sure that we are I, I, I kind of see myself in a sense as being the voice for the animal so I think it's really important to help owners to better understand their animals because there's often a lot of things that the animals are saying that the owners are just completely missing and yeah. when they start to realize as I say, if I touch your hips and you suddenly shoot to the couch and get away from me, maybe your animal's actually trying to say something to you. So I think through that, the owners now, when they're sitting with the animals, have a much better understanding of what the animals are saying. To I love that. You're a voice for the animals. It's awesome. Yes. That should be your tagline. <laughs> Um, one last thing, Sean, is uh, you mentioned that you were doing horses. So when yeah. you first started your mobile clinic, were you doing equines and small animals? And did you then transition to small animals? I, I think it's always been my goal, in a sense, to do both. But I think what has happened is the fact that the dog side of things is, is such a huge gap for people working in the dog industry that quite organically without me necessarily trying I, before I knew it I was full up with dogs and I was just doing horses here and there so most of my work is with dogs but I do have a few very loyal horse clients that just keeps my foot in the door and I've always said that if I ever restart my business somewhere else um, I would really like to put a bit more focus on building a horse side of my business because I'm very good with horses as much as I am with, with dogs but it was just something where it just happened that before I knew it I was seeing six cases a day and most of them were dogs and I just think it's because of a, a, the demand for the industry in the small animal side of things that that's just how it ended up flowing. I know I keep saying last question but I've got one more question for you. <laughs> um, so I mean do most of your clients come through referrals or do you have like a marketing budget are you doing quite a lot of marketing? I, I do absolutely zero marketing. Um, I know you are very passionate about marketing but I'm very intimidated about marketing but just because I only have so many hours in the day and without really having to put much effort into getting clients they just seem to find their way to me. So I've got um, a number of just normal small animal vet practices that I've built very good relationships with. So some of my referrals come from that. And then also some of my referrals, they'll either just find me on the internet or they'll come to me through word of mouth. But I don't really do any marketing on the side and I don't put much effort into it because if I start encouraging more people to come through to me, I, I, I honestly just don't have enough hours in the day to yeah. keep up with all of it. And yeah, there's a bit of a kind of flow of sometimes you'll have little quiet patches, but 
I don't often have quiet patches. Like I must say, like I've been very blessed in my business over the last eight years is that it's, it's just happened and um, I'm busy all day, every day. So I think that if I started to work with someone and I had a little bit more capacity, what I would love to do is I'd love to put a little bit more effort into building my relationships up with my vets and maybe going and sitting and doing talks with them and really focusing more on that veterinary relationship. Um, But I wouldn't, I don't do that much on social media and stuff. Well, it's a great place to be. Yeah, so, yeah. But my advice is not to get too comfortable because yeah. sometimes, you know, you've got the market there. Just now, yeah. somebody comes, a big vet rehab practice opens around the corner from where you are, and suddenly your market is gone. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So, yeah, it's it's sometimes a place where we would be very comfortable and we get a bit of complacent. So keep yeah. up those vet, vet visits and keep up with that networking. Yes. Yes. Awesome, Sean. It's been amazing chatting to you. Thank you for all the advice that you shared and for sharing your journey with us. I think that the vet rehabbers that have been listening have learned a lot. Thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Have an awesome day. Okay. Thanks, Bye. Nick. Bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. And please, if you get a moment, head over to Stitcher or iTunes and leave me a review. It's a really lonely job being a podcaster. And so the only time I get to hear from you or know that you're out there is when I get a review and know that I read every single one of your reviews. So to those of you that have left reviews, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Every time we get a review, it really helps to get the Vet Knee Rehabilitation Podcast out there to all the vet rehabbers all over the world. All right, vet rehabbers, so if you are looking for more continuing education in the field of veterinary rehabilitation, head over to onlinepetout.com. Go be awesome, guys.